In peaceful neighborhoods, four horrifying crimes remain unsolved. An elderly couple is brutally murdered. A beloved man is meticulously killed. And a young lawyer dies mysteriously. These gruesome and bizarre cases still baffle investigators and haunt the communities. Discover the chilling details and lingering questions that keep these mysteries alive. In the sun-drenched lakeside utopia of Edenton, Georgia, a beloved elderly couple's retirement dream turned into an unspeakable nightmare. Neighbors made a grisly discovery in the Dermans' garage, his lifeless body bearing horrific signs of a brutal struggle. His wife, Shirley, was nowhere to be found. This real-life horror story gripped the tight-knit community of Eatonton with fear and disbelief. To anyone observing from the manicured shores of Lake Ockany, Russell and Shirley Dermond appear to embody the American dream's twilight. After building a prosperous restaurant, the high school sweethearts had settled into their long-planned retirement haven. Their million-dollar home in the Great Waters neighborhood was a monument to the life they'd built together. Their dream retirement property was their lakefront home on a Jack Nicklaus-designed golf estate. Those who knew them well painted Russell as a disciplined businessman and avid golfer who could be firm but fair. His wife, Shirley, was the creative counterpoint, an eloquent writer, talented artist, and avid wordsmith who loved crosswords. The couple had two sons, Brad and Keith, and a daughter, Leslie. Their third son, Mark, was gunned down in 2000 after a botched drug deal. They adored their big family, which had been extended to nine grandkids. Their lives were filled with peace, joy, and the comforts of their retirement. But in May 2014, this tranquility was shattered by an act of unspeakable violence that would leave investigators and the community baffled for years to come. What followed was a series of events that no one could have predicted. In the days leading up to their tragic deaths, Russell and Shirley's movements painted a picture of normalcy that made their brutal murders even more shocking. Everyday activities masked the looming tragedy. That Thursday, Russell was seen running errands around Eatonton. He went to the supermarket to pick up groceries and to the pharmacy for a prescription. That evening, he and Shirley spoke with their son, Brad over the phone, discussing plans and everyday matters. Shirley, known for her love of bridge, had attended her regular game with friends just days earlier. The following day, Russell was seen walking the golf course near his home. It was the last time he was seen alive. That Saturday, the couple were expected to attend a Kentucky Derby party, hosted by their neighbors. As the weekend drew near, their plans were set. However, concern grew among their friends when they failed to show up. Known for their punctuality, the Dermans' absence raised the first signs of alarm. When repeated calls went unanswered, concern grew. The following Tuesday, friends decided to check in on them. Pushing through the unlocked front door, nothing seemed out of place inside. But when they checked the garage, they made a grisly find. Russell's lifeless body lay in a pool of blood, slumped behind one of the couple's cars. Towels had been placed around him to contain the blood from seeping under the garage door. Horrifically, he had been decapitated, and his head was missing. His body displayed unmistakable signs of a brutal struggle and mutilation. Russell's hands were bent and mangled, smeared with his own blood. And perhaps most disturbingly, investigators found a clump of gray hair, likely belonging to his wife, Shirley, caked into a wound on Russell's finger. Grisly evidence that he had fought for his life against immense force and violence. Streaks of blood trailed through the garage, mapping a vicious physical confrontation that ended in unimaginable brutality. The discovery sent shockwaves through the community, prompting a flurry of law enforcement activity. As investigators combed the Derman home, the urgency to find Shirley intensified, revealing her mysterious disappearance. More than 70 police officers and cadaver dogs searched the estate and surrounding lake area for clues on Shirley's whereabouts, but without success. Ten days after Russell's body was discovered, a gruesome find emerged from Lake Ossany. Fishermen found Shirley's body, weighted down with cinder blocks, shackled to her ankles. 
miles away from the residence. This discovery pointed to the possibility that the crime might not have been entirely committed within the Dermond home. Police were now dealing with a double homicide and very little evidence. The initial investigation revealed no signs of forced entry, suggesting the killer, or killers, might have been known to the Dermans. As the details emerged, the case grew more complex. At the very least, they had knowledge of the couple's routines and home layout. Despite the brutality of the murders, no valuables were taken from the home. Financial records showed no unusual activity, and their safety deposit box and wills were intact. This lack of theft, coupled with the extreme measures taken to obscure evidence, suggested that the crime was personal, rather than financially motivated. But if not for financial gain, what could inspire such a violent crime? FBI profilers were brought in to assist with the investigation. Their analysis indicated that the perpetrators were familiar with using guns and knives. They also suggested that more than one person might have been involved. The intimate nature of the crime, a decapitation requiring substantial physical force, led to theories about personal vendettas fueled by deranged hatred. Police wondered whether someone who knew them very, very well could be the culprit. The investigation faced hurdles from the outset. Adding to the mystery, there was no security footage available. About a month before the murders, a storm had knocked out power to the neighborhood's security camera, and the malfunction had gone unnoticed. This left investigators without crucial evidence of who might have entered or exited the community around the time of the murders. Despite extensive interviews and searches, including questioning every resident, gardener, handyman, and day laborer in the gated community, no definitive leads emerged. Even with thorough questioning, the trail remained cold. The lack of physical evidence, such as unusual fingerprints or DNA, further complicated the investigation. Russell's missing head is one of the most puzzling aspects of the case. This disturbing detail hinted at the calculated nature of the crime. Gunshot residue found on his collar suggested he had been shot in the head. Decapitating him was likely an attempt to prevent the recovery of the bullet, which could have provided important forensic evidence. This meticulous and calculated act hinted at the killer's desperation to protect their identities. The Dermot killings remain one of the most baffling and disturbing cases in Georgia's history. Among the darker theories investigated was whether a hired hitman had been contracted to kill the Dermots. After building a successful franchise empire, had they made shady rivals or angry employees hell-bent on vengeance? However, deep dives into their business dealings and inner circles yielded no concrete suspects or death threats. In the years after the double murder, new developments or clues in the Dermot case have repeatedly led to dead ends. Despite exhaustive efforts, the case has remained unsolved. However, recent hints from the investigators suggest that new forensic methods might finally provide important leads. With new forensic techniques, hope has been rekindled. One of the most exciting advancements is the ability to retest DNA evidence collected from the couple's home and vehicles. Earlier tests didn't find any useful DNA, but new technology for analyzing old or damaged samples gives hope that this new round of tests might finally identify the killers. From the horrifying mystery of the Dermans, we move to a brutal murder that reveals another dark secret. In the peaceful suburbs of Aurora, Colorado, where life seemed idyllic and uneventful, a horrifying discovery shook the community to its core. Oki Kite, a beloved and unassuming man, was brutally murdered in his own home. This crime, marked by meticulous planning and sadistic execution, left investigators and residents alike grappling with questions that remain to this day. But who was Oki Al Kite, the man behind the tragedy? To truly understand the depth of this crime, we must first explore his life and character. Al Kite was a 53-year-old finance professional, known for his kindness and reliability. Since moving to Colorado in 1998, Al had embraced a simple, outdoorsy lifestyle, enjoying fishing and spending time with his friends and family. He was engaged to be married, and looked forward to a future filled with love and companionship. Al's career reflected his meticulous nature, and colleagues respected him for his dedication and willingness to help. 
His trusting nature led him to rent out his basement for extra income, a decision made with characteristic openness. Generous and community-minded, Al was the neighbor who always lent a hand, whether fixing a pipe or offering advice. Little did Al know that his open-hearted decision to rent out his basement would lead to a terrifying encounter that would change his life forever. His life, marked by warmth and trust, tragically ended when his good nature brought a dangerous stranger into his home. The basement unit had a bathroom, bedroom, and family room, making it a suitable living space. Al advertised in the library nearby, hoping to find a reliable tenant. A few weeks before his murder, a man used the alias Robert Cooper responded to Al's ad. Cooper claimed to be from the East Coast and working for Wells Fargo. During his visit to view the unit, Al's fiance, Indela, Linda Angela Poulos, dropped by. But Cooper, whom she described as a well-dressed man with a limp, made a hasty exit. As Al unknowingly welcomed Cooper into his home, he had no inkling of the dark intentions that lurked beneath the stranger's calm demeanor. Cooper provided false information on the rental agreement, including a fake name, social security number, references, and address. The phone he used to contact Al was a burner phone, purchased from a convenience store, activated 30 days later to avoid surveillance footage retention. Robert's appearance marked the beginning of the end for Al. Cooper's behavior and meticulous planning suggested a highly intelligent and brazen offender. On May 22, 2004, Al's last day began typically. He dropped his fiancée off at the airport in the morning and spoke to her twice later in the day. The second call, around 3.30 p.m., felt unusual to Linda, as Al sounded short and odd, leading her to believe Cooper might have been in the condo at that time. What started as an ordinary day for Al would soon spiral into a nightmarish sequence of events, the full horror of which would only be uncovered days later. Two days later, police entered Al's townhouse for a welfare check after a call from his concerned sister. The upper levels appeared normal, but the basement revealed a scene of unimaginable horror. His body was bound with a unique method, tied around the upper arms, above the elbows, and twice above the knees. The bindings and the methodical nature of the torture pointed to a meticulously planned act. In a meticulous attempt to erase evidence, the killer soaked several items in bleach. Kitchen knives, a honing rod, a drinking glass, and Al's keys. However, a single drop of blood on the basement stairs, not belonging to Al, provided investigators with a crucial lead. The killer used Al's kitchen knives to inflict numerous wounds, including inserting knives above his eyeballs and into his ears and shoulders. Al was tortured for hours, with extensive bruising on the bottoms of his feet, indicative of a method called falaka, a form of foot beating common in Turkey. Ultimately, Al was stabbed 22 times, his head was nearly severed. As investigators delved into the horrifying scene, they began to piece together the chilling details of Al's final moments. Despite efforts to clean up, the killer made a crucial mistake. This blood sample, preserved and tested, would become a vital piece of evidence in the ongoing investigation. Despite the immediate and extensive efforts by investigators, Robert Cooper had vanished without a trace. His real identity was a significant hurdle. This crucial piece of evidence provided a glimmer of hope in an otherwise perplexing case, propelling the investigation forward. After the murder, the killer stole Al's truck and drove to a nearby ATM, where he was photographed wearing a ski mask and gloves, withdrawing $1,000 from Al's account. This was the only photo police had of the culprit. The drop of the blood found at the scene was tested, revealing DNA linked to Southeastern European ancestry, possibly the Balkan region. But the FBI's national DNA system did not find any matches. Despite the killer's efforts to conceal his identity, the investigation yielded critical forensic insights that hinted at his origins. Additionally, experts pointed to the unique binding and torture techniques, suggesting possible ties to the Turkish Hezbollah, known for similar methods. The trail went cold, despite exhaustive efforts, including nationwide alerts and media coverage. Over the years, various theories have emerged about the true identity of Robert Cooper. Some believe he was a professional hitman, while others speculate he was a drifter with a history of violent crimes. Despite the extensive investigation, many questions remained unanswered, 
The personal nature of the attack suggested Al was specifically targeted, though no clear motive was identified. Some speculated the crime would be a random act by a transient or serial criminal, though the planning suggested otherwise. Initially considered, but the extreme brutality and lack of stolen valuables challenged this theory. The case remains open and active, with the Aurora Police Department and the FBI continuing to pursue leads. Genealogy testing continues to be used to build the suspect's family tree in hopes of identifying the elusive killer. In Washington, D.C., the threat came from within the next victim's close circle of friends. On a hot summer's evening, the peace of a quiet townhouse in Washington, D.C. was shattered by a horrific crime. A young, promising lawyer was murdered in his friend's home under chilling circumstances. How did this overnight stay with friends turn into a night of unimaginable horror? Robert Wohn, a 32-year-old promising lawyer known for his thoughtfulness and reliability, graduated cum laude from the University of Pennsylvania and was on a successful career path. His career was a promising path, having worked for a multinational law firm before becoming general counsel for Radio Free Asia. He was also actively involved in the Asian Pacific American Bar Association, a key legal advocacy group, and was set to be sworn in as its president. In his personal life, Robert was happily married to Catherine Ellen Yu and lived in Oakton, Virginia. Robert was kind-hearted and was known to put change into the expired parking meters for strangers. He was, by all accounts, a man who cared deeply for those around him. What brought Robert to spend the night at his friend's house that evening? After working late that evening, Robert decided to stay overnight at his college friend Joseph Price's house. Price, a lawyer, lived with his partners Victor Zaborski and Dylan Ward in a polyamorous relationship. Their townhouse on Swan Street was close to Robert's office, making it a convenient place for him to stay. Robert arrived at the house around 10.30 p.m. According to his friends, he took a shower and went to bed. The men soon retired to their respective rooms. Victor was awakened by a chime from a security device, indicating the house's doors had been opened. Moments later, he heard a scream. Rushing to Robert's room, they discovered he had been attacked. The trio found a knife from the kitchen set on Robert's chest. They moved the knife to a bedside table and lifted his shirt, revealing three massive stab wounds. Meanwhile, Victor frantically called 911, telling the dispatcher that an intruder had stabbed their guest while the household was asleep. NBC emergency 911 operator 6752. Do you need police, fire, or ambulance? What's wrong, ma'am? Uh, we had someone that was in our house, evidently, and they stabbed somebody. Okay, somebody's inside the house now? I don't know. We heard... Are they bleeding? You see someone yes. bleeding? Someone is bleeding in our house. Okay, where's they bleeding from? Uh, I think he's... I think in the stomach. In the stomach? Is he cautious? Uh, Calm down for me. I'm going to send some help, okay? Female or male? It's a male. He's a friend of ours. He was spent, he was spending the night with us. Okay, and who was the person that stabbed him? Do you know? Is he is, is he conscious? We need an ambulance. Ma'am, no, listen to me. He's not conscious. He's not conscious at all. No, we need someone right now. Is he breathing? Is listen, he, listen to me. Calm down. I'm going to help you. Okay, is he breathing? I'm upstairs, and he's downstairs. I don't know. The paramedics arrived at 11:54 p.m. Victor was crying on the phone and expressed fear about going downstairs to let them in. Paramedics found Robert dressed in shorts and a t-shirt on top of a made-up bed. His wallet and watch were on the table, and a kitchen knife on another. The first responder noted that it seemed Robert had been cleaned, dressed, and placed back on the bed after being wounded. Despite the severity of the stab wounds, there was little blood on his body and almost none on his clothes. There were no signs of forced entry or a violent struggle, and nothing had been stolen. When police arrived, they noticed the three housemates were wearing white bathrobes and appeared to have recently showered. They seemed unusually calm. The three were separated and taken in for questioning for several hours. A detective later discovered that Robert's Blackberry showed two unsent emails. One at 11.05 to his wife, saying he was about to go to bed. 
Two minutes later, he emailed colleagues to confirm a lunch date. Did Robert write these emails himself, or was there something more sinister at play? However, police failed to copy the phone's hard drive before returning it to Robert's employers, who wiped it, resulting in the loss of potential evidence. How could such crucial evidence be lost, and what else could have been missed in this complex case? As the investigation continued, less than three months after Robert's death, the trio's townhouse was struck by another crime. This time, a burglary resulted in the theft of electronics valued in the thousands. It soon emerged that Joseph's brother, Michael, was involved. The burglary raised numerous questions about its timing and intent. Was it a coincidence, or a reminder to the police about the frequency of break-ins in the area? Or perhaps a veiled attempt to dispose of evidence? Investigators were particularly interested in Michael, especially after learning he missed a class the very night Robert was killed. Although Michael's partner insisted that they were together that night, police believed the burglary disrupted an arrest they had anticipated in the murder case. How did this subsequent crime impact the already complex investigation into Robert's death? The initial theory proposed by the housemates was that an intruder had entered the house, stabbed Robert, and left without taking anything. However, this story quickly fell apart. There was no sign of forced entry, and nothing valuable was missing. The house was undisturbed, and it seemed unlikely that an intruder could have committed such a precise crime without anyone noticing. A neighbor reportedly heard a scream between 11 and 11.30 p.m., yet the 911 call was only made at 11.43 p.m., raising red flags for police. The discovery of a bloody knife that didn't match the wounds and the missing knife from Dylan's cutlery set added to the mystery. Despite these severe wounds, there was no blood on Robert's body or the floor. A light film of blood with striation marks suggested someone had wiped his chest. But the housemates maintained their innocence. The police found an assortment of sex toys that appeared to be torture instruments, leading them to speculate whether Robert had been sexually assaulted and restrained before being murdered. This theory was bolstered by the evidence of sexual assault found on Robert's body. Further forensic tests revealed six needle puncture marks, suggesting he had been drugged, though no drugs were found in his system. Could it be that those closest to him held a key to solving the mystery? Two years after his murder, the three men were charged with obstruction of justice and conspiracy to tamper with evidence. Prosecutors alleged they lied to investigators and staged the crime scene. But in 2010, despite all the evidence, the trio was found not guilty due to insufficient evidence. The judge believed the men knew who killed Robert, but was not convinced of their guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. The following year, his wife filed a $20 million wrongful death lawsuit against the three. The case was settled out of court for an undisclosed amount, but the settlement did little to bring closure to Robert's loved ones. How could justice be so elusive in such a high-profile case? Despite the legal proceedings, many questions remain unanswered, including who killed Robert Wong. But as the case remains unsolved, there is still hope that new evidence or a confession could one day bring answers. A disturbing case involving a young boy has yielded few leads. What really happened to Christopher Aaron Morris? The 11-year-old's lifeless body was found in a dishwasher. There were no physical signs of abuse, yet wild claims of torture and sexual assault circulated online. With a botched investigation, missing evidence, and unexplored leads, why is this chilling case so shrouded in mystery? Christopher Aaron Morris, along with his sister Ashley, was an army brat, a term often used to describe children of military personnel. Living at Shepherd Air Force Base in Wichita Falls, Texas, Chris was no stranger to the disciplined yet turbulent life that comes with a military family. When his parents separated, Chris and Ashley found themselves navigating a new world with their father, while their mother battled severe drug addiction. Chris, a hyper but responsible child, was known for his love of Star Trek, Legos, football, and Taekwondo. He dreamt of becoming an astronaut, adorning his room with pictures of space and heroes in spacesuits. Despite the challenges at home, he was a protective brother 
and a loving son. On September 25th, 2000, a weather makeup day meant Chris had no school. His stepmother took her two daughters to Oklahoma, but his father decided Chris should stay home. It wasn't unusual for him to be home alone, as he was trusted to take care of himself. His father, working on the base, checked in on him around lunchtime, and everything seemed fine. However, when Chris's father returned home at 2 p.m., he found the house eerily quiet. In Chris's bedroom, the sight of dishwasher racks set off alarm bells. He rushed to the kitchen and discovered his son's clothes piled beside the dishwasher. Inside the machine, he found his son's lifeless body, and it was clear the dishwasher had been run through a full cycle. The authorities were called immediately, and the investigation began. Police initially theorized it might have been a tragic accident, but Ashley pointed out a crucial detail. The dishwasher had a latch that had to be manually moved to lock it, making it impossible for a boy to accidentally lock himself inside. This raised a troubling question. Who locked him in the dishwasher and turned it on? All lies immediately turned to his father. Chris's father, known for his short temper, was an easy target for suspicion. One military police officer accused him from the start, even before any substantial evidence was collected. Yet, Ashley remained steadfast in her belief that her father was innocent. Adding to the confusion, $200 was missing from the house, but nothing else was taken. Could robbery have been the motive? As the investigation progressed, two additional suspects emerged. One was a dishwasher repairman scheduled to fix the dishwasher that was broken. Since the machine had been working at the time of Chris's death, the repairman had to have visited the house sometime that day. While details around this are few, Ashley says the repairman must have been cleared by police because no arrest was made. The other suspect was a teenager who was visiting the base. This teenager had apparently been talking about Chris and knew details about the case that hadn't been released to the public. Oddly, he was sent to Florida a few days after the boy's death, and police did not follow up on this lead. Three different agencies, the FBI, military police, and local authorities became involved, leading to a chaotic investigation. Evidence was mishandled, and a palm print found outside the dishwasher couldn't be matched to anyone at the house. The case was further complicated by infighting among the agencies on who would take the lead in the investigation, resulting in contaminated evidence and lost leads. A few weeks prior to his death, Chris had stood up to bullies at school who were mocking a child with learning disabilities. This altercation was out of character for Chris, who generally avoided fights. Could this incident have made him a target? Despite the turmoil at home, the youngster was a bright and enthusiastic child, whose life was cut short in a manner that defies comprehension. The official ruling on his death was undetermined, neither homicide nor accident. This only deepened the mystery. There was also a known serial killer in Texas around the same time, targeting young boys. However, he was arrested two months before Chris's death, leaving investigators to question any potential connections. But there's another layer to this story that makes it even more haunting. Why is there so little information available about Christopher's case? Why are there so few hits when you search his name online? This isn't just a case of a young boy's tragic death, it's also a story of silence and forgotten evidence. Could it be that the conflicts between the investigating agencies led to deliberate suppression of the information? Or was it simply a case that fell through the cracks, overshadowed by other events and forgotten by the media? Furthermore, claims of sexual abuse and torture surrounding his death surfaced online largely due to posts made by a cousin on a forum discussing the case. Despite no evidence supporting these allegations in the police reports, the cousin's sensational claims gained major attention. His sister believes these accusations were made for notoriety or attention, as they were entirely unfounded and deeply distressing for the family. But what truly happened to Christopher? Was it a prank on horribly wrong? A botched robbery? or something more sinister? And why has this case faded into obscurity, leaving his family without closure? The truth remains locked away, much like Chris was in that dishwasher. If you have any information about any of these cases, please contact your local police. Your tip 
could be the missing piece to solving these haunting puzzles. And if you want me to cover other bizarre mysteries, let me know in the comments below.